Shalom Abayim. Welcome to Beth Adonai, uh, the house of the Lord this morning for 10 a.m. teaching. We're continuing our series on uh, who are we in Messiah. As I spoke last week, uh, 73 times, uh, Shaul uses this in his epistles, 15, time, 15 times the most out of all he uses in the book of Romans. So, uh, for the first part of these series, uh, that's pretty much where we're going to be. Uh, but uh, let's let's go to the Father in prayer. Venu Shabbat Shemayim, our Father who is in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your Shabbat. I thank you for this holy day that is above all other days. I thank you for the sanctity of this day that it is to be set apart and to be treated holy is that we rest, we come, we focus our hearts and our minds on you and how you have transmitted your word to us. And I pray this morning, Father, for your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, to enlighten our eyes and our minds so that we may understand the things that were written by Shaul for our edification and for our understanding uh, as the uh, apostle to the congregations in, in the, his writings today that speak to us and, and help us to understand what it means to be the community of Yeshua. So as we go into your word today, Lord, I just ask for to open our ears, our hearts, and open our understanding that may we, we may understand the things that you want to speak to us and, and that we understand our identity and who we are in your Mashiach, in your Messiah, Father. So we, we pray these things in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. All right. Uh, as I've already stated, we're continuing our series in uh, Who Are We in Messiah? And as always, I like to recap so that we can get our minds focused on what we are learning, what we have learned in the past, and where we're going from here. So what we've discovered up until this point, uh, going through uh, Romans chapter 3, that we are all on the same footing. We're all on the same footing. We're all on the same level when it comes to being in Messiah Yeshua, be it Jew or Gentile, man or woman, adult or child. Uh, we are all on the same footing. Scriptures say that all are under sin and have fallen short of the glory of God. And it's only through the grace of Hashem in Messiah Yeshua that any of us, Jew or Gentile, are able to draw near to Hashem. It's only through the perfect sacrifice that we are able to draw near. It never has been, nor will it ever be, by way of circumcision, ethnic identity, Torah observance, or anything else produced by man uh, that gives one person an advantage over, uh, over another in the kingdom of heaven. There's no boasting whatsoever for any person. There's one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Okay, so we've also learned, or refreshed our, uh, our understanding that there's now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. Why? Because we've been set free from the influence of the Yitzhar Hara, the evil inclination which held us captive from our mother's womb. The evil inclination has been present with us from the beginning and we have spent a lot of time uh, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil until we come to the knowledge of Messiah and then we, have, we are set free. We're being transformed from obeying the old nature to serve in the spirit. We have learned that there are two laws operating within ourselves. Okay, The spirit of truth and the spirit of perversity or the spirit of God and the, the, uh, the Yetzer Hara. And it's impossible to serve two masters. It's impossible to serve two masters. Yeshua said, no one can be a slave to two masters, for either will hate the first and love the second, or scorn the second and be loyal to the first. You can't be a slave to both God and money. So one should put to death the old man and be freed to serve the living God. This is done through dying to sin. We talked about last, uh, last week about dying to sin. And Paul, uh, Shaul uses the, uh, the, the halakhic uh, dictate of when a woman is 
uh, re freed from her uh, marriage obligation is either through divorce or through uh, the husband dying. And so he, he, he takes the, uh, the uh, analogy of that to say that sin is dead to us. Um, the Yetzer Hurrah is dead to us. We no longer, it no longer has authority over us as so we put it to death. And it's through the, resurrection, the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. Uh, it's also known uh, by Shaul as the baptism into Yeshua through his death and resurrection. So man's mind must constantly will to obey God since his members are continually being tempted to present themselves to unrighteousness. Sin no longer has dominion over us that we should obey it in its lusts. Okay, so I did a lot of speaking last week about the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination and how sneaky it is and how subtle it is to try to tempt us to follow the old man, to tempt us to eat from the, the good side or possibly even the evil side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But speaking of how the Yetzer Hara continuously tempts us, let me give you an example of how the Yetzer Hara is very subtle, Okay. A rabbi, a priest, and a minister. They were all gathered around a table for lunch one day, uh, comparing miracles. And the priest relayed that one day he was driving his car between parishes, and all of a sudden a storm just cropped up out of nowhere. A lot of rain, a lot of wind, uh, very hectic to drive in, and all of a sudden his car started spinning around and around and around, completely out of control, and so he let go of the steering wheel, and he just prayed to the Father for help. He called out to the Father for help, and when he opened his eyes, the car had stopped spinning. He was at the bottom of the hill, still on the road, and all the cl clouds had cleared away, and it was just blue skies. And the, and the other two looked at him saying, and agreed and said, yeah, absolutely, that was certainly a miracle. Okay, so the minister began to relay his tale, also experiencing a miracle. He said that he was on a ferry one time, crossing from one land to another, uh, when a big storm cropped up. Gale force winds blowing, waves bashing up against the, the ship, and, and they were afraid that the ship was going to turn over and capsize. And so he closed his eyes, he began to pray to the Father, and all of a sudden the, the seas calmed just as, as though Yeshua himself calmed the seas and all of the clouds and everything went away and they were safe to make it to the end of their journey. And the other two looked at him and agreed and said, yeah, that was definitely a miracle. Well, the rabbi sat there and he thought for a minute and he goes, ah, I too have a, a miracle. He said, one day on Shabbat, I was walking towards the shul. I was on my way to synagogue uh, for services, and I tripped over a crack in the, in the sidewalk and fell face down. He said, but when I looked up, lo and behold, there was a $100 bill laying right in front of me. And he said, it was Shabbat. What could I do? Right? I can't handle money on the Shabbat. So he, so he said, he, he too. I said, I too. Closed my eyes. I prayed to the Father, and all of a sudden, all around me, it was Tuesday, and it was Shabbat everywhere else. <laughs> okay, so the Yetzer Hurrah. The Yetzer Hurrah is very subtle. It tempts us to learn how to, to it, it tempts us to twist our thinking into uh, manipulating situations. Okay. Okay, so uh, now that I have that out of the way, let us move on to our topic for today. Okay, let's move on to our topic for today. I'm going to be in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, uh, I don't have a PowerPoint this week as well, so uh, if you have your Bibles, or maybe if you have it memorized, that would be a good thing as well, okay? And we see in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable of God, which is your reasonable service. All right, the first thing that, that just jumps out to me is in the midst of this series, Paul says the word therefore a lot. He makes a lot of statements, then he ties up his arguments, and then he gives you the conclusion. And it seems, though, as we're going through this, uh, this understanding of Shaul talking about uh, who we are in Messiah, his conclusion always ends up in Messiah Yeshua. His conclusion always ends up that we're in Messiah Yeshua. That is the answer. So I found that, that quite interesting. Um, 
And so, uh, since our last discussion from Romans chapter 8, verses 9, 10, and 11, or chapters 9, 10, and 11 have, have taken place. Again, I know that's profound. Uh, I didn't want to go all the way through those chapters, but maybe just do a little bit of a recap on that. Um, in these chapters, Shaul begins to explain, explain the plans of the sovereign one of Israel. It wasn't that God had replaced Israel or rejected Israel, but his plan was to elect the Gentiles also and bring them into Israel. Okay? I know a lot of people have a hard time understanding that. Um, but God elected Israel, but God's plan included electing Gentiles to come into Israel as well. And in order for that to take place, the message had to leave Israel and be accessible to everyone. Okay, For a long time, the message was just in Israel. God was dealing with his nation. And it's through the prophets and, and, and through the writings and all of that within Israel. But at some point, in order for the, uh, the Gentiles to be elected also and be able to come into Israel, the message had to leave Israel. Okay, It's interesting. Uh, Yeshua talked about... Um, fruit and seed in Matthew chapter 13 he said the uh, the word of the, uh, of God is the seed in the parable of the seed okay if you look in in the Cyclopedia Britannica under the word un, under the definition of the word seed it says that the seed is the most important part of the plant okay the rest of the entire plant serves only to propagate the seed from generation to generation and, and the way that a seed is dispersed is when the wind comes and blows it away, either through the fruit falling to the ground or it blows it away by uh, seeds away by, um, you know, you see those little, and mostly they come from dandelions, but uh, the little things that are carried away in the wind. Okay, so it's very interesting that it says that it is the wind that carries the seed. Okay. We could say in Hebrew, it is the ruach, the spirit that carries the seed or the zarah. Um, but also Yeshua said that the seed is the word of God. Okay, So it is the spirit of God that propagates the word of God. And if it wasn't for Yeshua um, being uh, taken away, the disciples would have clung right there in Jerusalem and the word wouldn't have went out. So God's sovereign plan, uh, it says in the prophets, and I can't remember off the top of my head where it was, he said, if you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And it was in God's sovereign plan that the message should leave Israel and go out to all four corners of the earth, all nations. This was done through the death, resurrection, ascension of the Messiah and the sending of the disciples. Okay, so um, we see in Romans chapter 9 through 11, Shaul is battling an argument that still rages on today in some people's minds. Uh, Romans 9, 10, 11 is about the election of Israel, that God's not done with Israel. He never was done with Israel. Um, but there are people who are bringing arguments. Uh, in, in Shaul's mind, in and, and, and writing this epistle, he's arguing an argument that the detractors from the other side are going to bring to him. And he's essentially battling replacement theology here. Uh, if you talk to some people today, they still insist that there's no longer an olive tree, but it has been cut down due to their unfaithfulness. Uh, Shaul even says so um, in, back in, in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 9. It says... Uh, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. 9, 9 verse 6. For they are not all Israel or Israel, nor are they children because they are seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's where it's at. Anyway, he, he goes on to talk about that they, they didn't receive the promises because they didn't receive it by faith. They didn't receive it by faith. But that doesn't mean that God's done with that. Okay, He had his sovereign plan. Um, but uh, some people, some people still hold to this idea 
that God's done with Israel, the church is now the thing, and that everybody needs to come into the church. But clearly, clearly when you read the book of Romans in context, that is not the case. Um, it's hard for the mind to understand sometimes. Um, at least it was for me for a very long time. Okay, Because when you, you, you begin looking at the scriptures from a historical standpoint, God calls his people to faithfulness time and time again. Over and over and over again, we see the, unfaithful of Israel, the unfaithfulness of Israel, and then God is calling them to faithfulness over and over and over again, and yet they're still the elected of God. For a long time, that was hard for me to understand. How could someone who continued to be unfaithful over and over and over again still be the chosen one? And Shaul illustrates this concept by using the terms vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy in Romans chapters 9, 10, or, uh, uh, 10 or 11. Okay? So, and, and that's what Paul is battling. He says, you can't, you can't say that the unfaithfulness, uh, unfaithfulness of Israel cancels out the promises of God. No one's unfaithfulness cancels out the promises of God. Because if they were, if we had the ability to get the promises, then, the, then we would have the ability to make the promises go away. But we don't. God's a God of his word. He said what he was going to do, and he's going to do it regardless of whether we're faithful in us or not. We have a part from our end, whether we want to partake in that. There are going to be covenant promises that are going to come to fruition, and that, the, that, that there is going to be the inheritance of the promises. The point is, are you going to be the one who puts yourself into the promises of God and, and remain in that, in his Messiah? Okay, so, uh, Shaul is showing, to sum up chapters 9 through 11, Shaul is showing that Hashem did not reject one in order to bring about the other. He didn't reject one, he elected this one, and then he elected that one to bring a remnant out of both to bring what we call the one new man. Okay, so Shaul explains in Ephesians chapter 2 that the dividing wall between the Gentiles and the Jews has been taken down, and that out of that is created one new man, and from the two, thus making peace. That's what he did. So what we see so far up into um, uh, chapter 12 of the book of Romans is that Shaul starts out, chapters 1 through 8, talking about the inclusion of the Gentiles. Then we see in chapters 9 through 11, he begins to explain about the Jew, Jewish people, Israel, um, coming into the community of believing. And now we have two different cultures. We've got two different cultures coming together to live with, within one community. And, and, and so uh, Shaul talks about uh, in Ephesians chapter 2 that the one new man, uh, and thus the two making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father." So he's, he's constantly talking about, and since Shaul is the apostle to the Gentiles, he's, he's constantly talking about the bringing together of the Jews and the Gentiles together in one community. He writes this letter to the, uh, to the Romans because he knows that out of this there are going to be contentions. You know, you can break it down to the very basic of society. When you have two separate people, um, coming together, there is potential for trouble. There's potential for conflict. There's potential for issues to arise. Much less in a huge congregation, uh, such as what was in, in Rome uh, when, when Shaul wrote his, uh, his epistle. So having established all this, we enter into the therefore in chapter 2. He talks about all of this, coming together, one big community, one side, culture, another side of culture, and having to explain that we are all in this together, he begins to explain how we're to get along. 
And Romans chapter 12 is a turning point. He's already given us the instructions or given us the understanding of what God's plan is. Now he's saying, this is how you're supposed to get along. This is how you're going to do it. I, I exhort you. I give you a teaching. I, I encourage you to do these things. Okay, and so Shaul draws out some of the major halakhic or practical implications of the common heritage of Jewish and Gentile believers in Messiah Yeshua. Okay, did you know that Shaul is a halakhic authority? Um, he's able to issue halakhic ordinances to the community in the same way any Jewish authority was able to issue ordinances within their community. For instance, the Rambam. Uh, most people know him as Maimonides. He was a halakhic authority. He was able to send out dictates or halakhic ordinances throughout the community that people would uh, adhere to. Uh, the uh, Rashi, Rashi was a halakhic authority. He had the same thing. He would send out um, communal standards, so to speak. In the Qumran uh, community, the Dead Sea Scrolls, he was the one who was issuing these was known as the teacher of righteousness. But he was the halakhic authority within the community that got to say, okay, here's what you do within this community. These are our standards that, that you adhere to in order to be a part of this community. So Shaul was that kind of authority. Where did he get that authority? Yeshua himself. Yeshua himself on the road to Damascus when he commissioned him to be one of his shlachim, one of his uh, 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 messengers. Um, this is where he received his, uh, his authority to be, uh, uh, issue halakhic ordinances. Okay, and he often he often reminded himself of that, uh, reminded his readers of that. He he would say, you know, uh, things like, "I exhort you, brothers. I I I give you good instruction," or or things like that. Uh, that he would remind his readers of his halakhic authority. All right, so let's begin with verse one of chapter twelve. It says, I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourselves as a sacrifice, living and set apart for God. This will please him. It is the logical temple worship for you. Okay, so the first thing that jumps out at me, it jumped out at me in this particular phrase, it says, in view of God's mercies. Okay, I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourselves as a sacrifice. Okay? So a relevant verse for us to understand what he's, he's getting at, this, this term in view of God's mercies, is 2 Samuel 24. Okay? And I, I won't read the chapter to you. I'll just kind of give you a, a summary of 2 Samuel 24. It's the scenario that Hashem is angry with Israel. He's very angry with Israel because of their idolatry. They, they, they have fallen away. Again, God's very angry with them. And so God moves Melech David, King David, to act against them by way of the Satan, by way of Satan. Okay? And the cross-reference is 1 Chronicles 21.1. In, uh, in 2 Samuel 24, it says that the Lord moved David in order to, to take a census or to number Israel. But if you cross-reference that to 1 Chronicles 21.1, 1, 1 Chronicles 21.1 1 says that it was Satan that did it. Not here to straighten this out for anybody, to you know tie it up in a nicely neat little package and hand it over. It's not the focus of this. There's a lot of issues that are tied up in that theologically people, you know, their brain kind of goes on tilt when they read this particular uh, uh, scripture uh, between the two it seems like there is uh, in Hebrew it's called a machloket it's a disagreement it's a, it's an argument um, and there's been a lot of ink spilled over this why was it a sin to, to number Israel why did it say in one text that God did it the next text it was Satan that did it we, we don't know all that but um so King David, he does just that. He was moved to number Israel, 
and he numbers the people, and then later on, King David repents of his acts. He realized that he wasn't supposed to do it. He understood that it made God angry to, uh, to number the people the way that he did. Then the prophet Gad comes to King David and presents the words of Adonai to him. King David is faced with three options. Okay, Since he numbered Israel, he was faced with three options. Either seven years of famine in the land, or he fleeing for, from uh, before his enemies for three months, or three days of plagues among the people. I mean, what a position to be in, right? God lets you choose your own punishment. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard place to be in, okay? So we, we learn from this that you, your actions have a far-reaching consequences to other people than just yourself, okay? David was moved to do something. He did it. And now guess what? Either there's going to be seven years of famine in the land. People are going to starve to death. Or his enemies are going to be chasing him around for three months. Or there's going to be three days of plagues. Wiping out and killing people. I mean, you, you stop to think. If David would have thought that this is what was going to come down the pipe... If he did what he was going to do, he probably wouldn't have done it. But unfortunately, we don't always see the akhirit. We don't always see the latter end of our actions. We don't always think through to think how many people this is going to affect uh, from this point on. That's why rabbis say that, that, that hating a person in your heart, and Yeshua said if you hate a person in your heart, you, you've essentially murdered them. Is because the act of murder kills generations of people. Not just the person you kill, but how many people are not going to live, you know? Who, who, but, a, but a person who, ha, who has the final cure to cancer would have been in, in that line of the family, you know? That, those kinds of things. So, so, so King David didn't really see the Akhrit. He acted based on what he was moved to do, and now he's faced with the consequences of what it is. And now he's got to choose his own punishment. But... We need to go back to the very beginning of, of 2 Samuel 24. It says that Hashem was already angry with the people to begin with. He was already angry with the people. They had already fallen into idolatry. This was, I, and this is my opinion. This is, this is, you know, could be wrong, could be right, I'm not sure. But my, my opinion is this, is this is God's way of enacting the punishment on the people because they were already acting wickedly as it was. Okay, so it was a hard position for David, I'm sure. King David. Okay, even Rashi. Rashi himself didn't even know uh, why this was. Hashem was angry with the people, and, and Rashi said, I don't even know why. I don't even know why God was angry, because the text doesn't tell us why he was, uh, other than they had been unfaithful. But his, just, his judgment is just and right. Okay, so he's, he's, King David is faced with a decision to make regarding the punishment. And his words in verse 14 of 2 Samuel 24 are very, very revealing. Uh, King David said to Gad, This is very hard for me. Let us fall into the hand of Adonai because his mercies are great rather than have me fall into the hand of man. Even though there was a coming great judgment, he knew that the mercies of Adonai are great. That's the point. Uh, you know, when we see Shaul in Romans chapter 12, when he says, um, where he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, he's, he's, he's going back over historical accounts, understanding that God is very merciful extremely merciful, even King David, knowing that he had to go through, he had to choose from these three punishments, he knew that if he chose the punishment of God, it was more merciful than the punishment of man. So, so that was the whole point of that. Okay, and another text that we see we can go back to is Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah 9, 18 through 21. It says, even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you up out of, the, out, out of Egypt and weren't great provocations, yet in your manifold mercies you did not forsake them in the wilderness. 
The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light in the way they should go. You also have your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Okay? How many of us as human beings would have looked at them creating the very thing that he just told them not to do. They heard God's words booming down from Mount Sinai. And then it wasn't too much longer and they're building a golden calf and bowing down to it. How many of us as human beings would have went, okay, I'll still give you your food. I'll still give you your water. I'll still lead you through. I'll still protect you. I'll still do all that stuff for you. Even though you turned your back on me. You committed the very thing I told you not to do. Okay? That demonstrates the mercies of God. Okay? So there are, there are many instances where the mercies of Hashem are shown throughout the Scripture. And this is what Shahul has in mind when he makes a st- statement in view of of the mercies of God. In essence, he's saying that since God has been so merciful throughout all generations to all people and has now made two into one, God God has been gracious to the Gentiles as well. He's been merciful. Uh, Shaul says in Romans that, that God is the... Uh, um, he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. He's, he's talking about those who follow him, those who don't. Even those who don't follow him, they shake their fist in his face. He still causes it to rain upon their lands. Okay, so in essence he's saying that since God has been so merciful and that, that now we are making two peoples into one, there will be an opportunity for strife to develop. There's an opportunity for there to be contentions because of the two different uh, the two different cultures in which people come from. Okay, so there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun whatsoever. As the longer I begin, the longer I live, the longer I'm, I'm the more I'm getting to understand that everything just repeats itself over and over and over again. I'm just discovering it because I'm only 46 years old. But this has been around from the very beginning. Okay? So there's strife right now in the body of Messiah over who is Gentile and who is Jewish. Today, 2,000 years after Yeshua, there's still strife about this very issue that Shaul talked about in Romans. Uh, you know, the, the earliest... Uh, the earliest... Um, Account of when Shoal wrote this was probably around eighty sixty, somewhere around that time he wrote this epistle, uh, and then uh, and there there's strife in, in right now in the body of Messiah over uh, over who is Jewish and who is Gentile and how each one relates to the commandments today still today we're still dealing with the same issues okay so he said in Romans chapter twelve one he said in the view of the mercies of God offer yourselves as a sacrifice living and set apart to God. A sacrifice is a means of drawing near. It's a means of drawing near. We draw, draw near to him and he, draw nears to, he draws near to us. It is only accomplished through the three T's. Okay? Tefillah, which is prayer. Tzedakah, which is charity or giving. And Teshuvah, which is repentance. Okay? The three T's. Tefillah, Tzedakah, and Teshuvah. Torah study is included in the teshuva, okay? So one can only repent when he finds out what he needs to be done in order to repent, i.e. through Torah study, okay? Uh, Verse 2, in other words, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of Olam Hazeh, this world. What are the standards of Olam Hazeh? Okay? To not be a living sacrifice, Obviously, it's completely opposed to the word of God. The, the world today, this world, says don't be a living sacrifice, but be selfish. Be extremely selfish and be self-centered because it's all about you, baby. That's what the world tells you. Do for you. You need this thing because you deserve it. Do this thing over here because that's what you feel like doing. That's what you do. Follow your heart. That's the worst advice anybody's ever given anybody. Don't follow your heart. 
the heart will lead you astray. Follow the word of God. Okay? Shaul explains it so eloquently in Galatians chapter 5, 13 through 15. He says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Again, in the, in the congregation in Galatia, the congregations in Galatia, he's talking about people, you have liberty within the congregations. Uh, Romans chapter 14, he talks about uh, not having, um, let me share a quote this correctly. He says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. He, he, it seems that Shaul is constantly trying to quell the arguments. He's, he's trying to suppress the, the strife that, that has a tendency to crop up within uh, these congregations and communities. Okay, even in, in, in Galatia, he has to do the same thing. He says, look, love one another. That's what the Torah tells you to do. You know, you'll be consumed by one another if you don't. You have liberty, but don't use it as an opportunity as for the flesh. Okay, so that's what he's getting at here in Romans chapter 12. Shaul was a champion of unity. Okay, again, the, the book of Galatians had to do with the Gentiles and the Jews living and operating within the same communities. When you stop to think about it deeply, it's very sad to come to the realization that there's a very real tendency for disunity in the body of the Messiah to develop. Okay? Not just between Jews and Gentiles, but between two people who come to, from two different backgrounds, different upbringings, cultural differences, experiences that have shaped our way of thinking, issues we have struggled with from a very early age. All of these things play a role or play a part in presenting a real challenge for people to get along in peace and unity. It's hard enough for two people in a marriage, coming from two different families, two different backgrounds, two different ways of thinking, two different ways of doing things, two different cultures, just to get two people in a marriage to do it, much less a congregation of people, or a series of congregations of peoples. It's, it's impossible. It seems impossible. It seems almost impossible in order to, to do this. But this is what Shaul was doing. He cuts right to the heart of the matter. He basically says, look, people, God has been so merciful to you in spite of your faults, your sins, your rebellious attitude towards him, and I am begging you to, and, and I urge you to present yourself to God as the ultimate authority and trust in him. That's where he's going with this. He's saying, therefore, since God has been merciful to you, you lay your life on the altar of Hashem and you become accountable to Him and, and follow His ways instead of following the standards of Olam Hazeh, the world to come, or the, this world, instead of operating in this world. Submit yourself to Him. Draw near to God. Okay, verses 2 and 3. It says, instead, keep letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what God wants and will agree that what he wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. For I am telling every single one of you, through the grace that has been given to me, not to have exaggerated ideas about your own importance. Instead, develop a sober estimate of yourself based on the standard which God has given to each of you, namely, trust. Okay? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here again, Shaul picks up the theme of the two masters. Okay? Describing how service to the world, which is the dominion of Belial, or uh, Baal, or Ashtaroth, or whatever false god you want to call it. They're all the same false gods, just whenever one uh, culture conquers another, they just change the name of the god, but it's, it's all the same concept. He, say, he picked up on the theme of the two masters, describing how service to the world is the dominion of the enemy. It is hostility to God and bondage to the spirit of flesh. Okay? Service to the world 
is hostility to God and bondage to the spirit of the flesh. This is accomplished, okay, so to, to break free from this, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it, it, it is accomplished through great pain and suffering. Laboring to break through these patterns of selfishness that we have developed in our lives up until a certain point. When we have been set free, we still have the, the mentality, though. Once, a, once a, 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 a servant is set free, they still have the servant mentality to the master that they were in servitude to. And now he is, he's telling us, now that you've been set free, now that we are one community, be renewed, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You start to begin to think differently. And by thinking differently, you begin to act differently. You got to break away from the old patterns is essentially what he's saying. You can't continue to serve the same master in your mind, even though you've been set free. Yeshua set you free. He broke the chains. He sent you walking. But as long as you have the mentality in your mind and you are still held captive to these thoughts of being in servitude to the old nature, then you will be in, in servitude to the old nature. And so he's saying that it's through great pain and through suffering and through uh, great strength that we have to work through these and, and, and break through these patterns of selfishness. Jacob, also known as James, picks up this theme also in James chapter 4. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Gives grace to the humble. Okay? This is in parallel with what Shaul is saying in Romans chapter 12. It's when a person thinks more highly of themselves than they ought to, that they are above somebody else, that somehow or another they are more spiritually developed, more spiritually mature, more spiritually better when they think of themselves over and above somebody else. He's saying, no, I'm telling you uh, to not think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Um, I, as I was doing my studies this work, I, I run across a letter that the Ramban wrote, Rabbi Moshe Ben Nachman, uh, also known as the Ramban. It's the er, uh, Egeret Rambam. It's the letter from the Rambam, which is interesting because it fit, and I wasn't even looking for anything like that. I was just kind of uh, browsing through some of the old websites that I had uh, for uh, different teachings. And this, this letter basically describes it. Now let me read it to you. It says, Accustom yourself to always speak all of your words calmly to every man and at every time. In doing so, you will prevent your anger from flaring, which is a bad attribute in man, in a man which may cause him to sin. And according to our rabbis, may their memories be blessed. Anyone who gets angry... All of Gehinnom holds sway over him, as it says in Kohelet or Ecclesiastes 11.10, and remove the anger from your heart and take away the bad from your flesh. And bad can only mean Gehinnom, as it says in Proverbs 16.4, and the sinner, he too, will have his day of bad. So when you will have freed yourself from anger, the quality of humility will enter into your heart, which is the best of all good traits, as it is written in Proverbs 22.4, the return for humility is fear of God. Through hum humility, you will also come to fear God. It will cause you to always think about where you came from and where you are going. 
Okay, and that while alive, you are only a maggot and a worm as after death, and before whom you will eventually stand for judgment, the glorious king, as it is written in 1 Kings 8.27. Even the heaven and the heavens of heaven cannot contain you, how much less the hearts of people. It is also written in Jeremiah 23.24, Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? So when you think about all these things, you will come to fear God who created you, and you will protect yourself from sinning, and thereby be happy with whatever happens to you. Wow, you want to talk about some perfect, some perfect words. You understand who you are in relationship to God, and how uh, uh, bringing humility into your life uh, causes... Um, causes fear of God, you start understanding who you are before the king, then you'll begin to be happy with whatever happens to you. Also, when you act humbly and modestly before everyone and fear God and sin, the radiance of his glory and the spirit of the Shekinah, the divine presence will rest upon you and you will live the life of the world to come in this world. In this world, you'll live the life of the world to come if you allow the Shekhinah, the divine presence, to come upon you by acting humbly in the way that you act. And now, my son, understand and observe that whoever feels that he is greater than others is rebelling against the kingship of heaven because he is adorning himself with his garments, with his garments. He's adorning himself with his garments when a person takes on arrogance and pride to themselves. The Lord reigns, he wears clothes of pride, Psalm 93.1. So it says, when God, God wears the clothes of pride, when man takes on pride and arrogance, he's now taken the king's clothes. He's now wearing the clothes of Hashem when he puts himself above someone else. What cause does one have for pride? Perhaps his wealth? Perhaps, uh, the Lord impoverishes and enriches, 1 Samuel 2.7. Perhaps his honor? It belongs to God, as it is written in 1 Chronicles 29.12. Wealth and honor come from you. So how could one adorn himself with God's honor? And one who prides himself in his wisdom surely knows that God takes away the speech of assured men and reasoning from the sages, Job 12.20. Thus all are equal before God. Since with his anger he lowers the proud, and, he, and, and when he wishes he raises the low. So humble yourself, and God will raise you up. Therefore, I will now explain to you, uh, to you how to always behave humbly. Speak gently at all times, with your head bowed, your eyes looking down to the ground and your heart focusing on God. Don't look at the face of the person to whom you are speaking. Consider everyone is greater than yourself. If he is wise or wealthy, you should give him respect. If he is poor and you are wealthy or wiser than he, consider yourself to be more guilty than he and that he is more worthy than you since when he sins, it is an inadvertent while you act knowingly. In all your actions, words, and thoughts, always regard yourself as standing before God with his Shekhinah, divine presence above you. For his glory fills the whole world. Speak with fear and awe as a servant in the presence of his master. Act with restraint in front of everyone. Someone, when someone calls you, don't answer loudly, but calmly as one who stands before his master. Take heed to study Torah constantly so you will be able to fulfill its commands. When you arise from your learning, reflect carefully on what you have studied to find a lesson in it that you can put into practice. Examine your actions every morning and evening, and in this way every one of your days will be spent in returning to God. Remove all worldly concerns from your heart during prayer. Prepare your heart before God. Purify your thoughts and think about the words before you utter them. Do this each and every day of your life and all your activities, and you will not come to sin. Just beautiful, absolutely beautiful about talking about humbling ourselves before others, remembering who God is, where we are, and then if we take upon ourselves one iota of pride or arrogance, then we have basically stolen God's glory and honor. And, and that is something that, that, that is very... Um, very important. I don't know who Rambam wrote this letter to, but it is filled with godly exhortation that parallels the words of Shaul right here in this passage. 
he talks about a lot of the same concepts and the ideas and understandings that Shaul has uh, the, when he penned Romans. Okay, So back to Romans chapter 12, verses 5 through 6. He says, For just as there are many parts that compose one body, but the parts don't all have the same function, so there are many of us, and in union with the Messiah, we comprise one body with each of us belonging to the others. There's the phrase we've been searching for. There's the phrase we're looking for. So there are many of us, and in union with the Messiah, in most of your Bibles it says, in Christ, in Messiah. Who are we in Messiah? We comprise one body. That's who we are in Messiah. We're one body. This one helping that one. That one helping that one. Because without the different parts of the body, we're not going anywhere. You can't have just, you know, uh, you can't have, I guess you know, some people do get around on one foot. That's not a very good analogy, is it? Um, the entire body helps to get the whole each part helps the whole to get from point A to point B. That's, that's my point. Each one works in conjunction to get the body from point A to point B, to, to get to the same goal, to get to the same, um, the same goal. No other way to say that. Okay? So we're all connected. We're all connected in Messiah Yeshua. That's his point. Who are we in Messiah? We're connected to one another now. I'm connected to you, you're connected to me, you're connected to her, she's connected to her. We're all connected together in Messiah Yeshua. And going back to Romans 8, Shaul makes a very important point. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. I love Paul because he doesn't pull, he doesn't pull any, he doesn't pull, he doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, he is not his. And so he's, he's essentially saying in Romans chapter 8, which eventually he gets to in Romans chapter 12, he says, that is, if indeed the Spirit is in you. I need to tell you that. I need to tell you. You need to examine to see whether or not the Spirit of the Messiah is in fact in you uh, because we're all in this together. It's very important that we're not in the flesh. You can't be in community and be in the flesh. You can't do it. It only serves to cause disunity. It only serves to cause problems and issues with, between people, and it splits congregations. We're all part of one organism. The body shouldn't fight against itself. The body wasn't designed to do that. The foot was not designed to fight against the hand. It wasn't. It was, it was designed to work in conjunction with one another. Yeshua said himself that a house divided will not stand. A house divided will not stand. Each person arguing to get his own way. <clears throat> Persuading the others that they are right. Okay, Splitting up congregations for what purpose? What purpose does that serve? It only serves to destroy and not to edify or to encourage or to build up. It, but it only serves to tear down when there's disunity. Okay? Shaul goes on to list the things that, we, that will keep the devourer at bay. Okay, the devourer at bay, verse 9 through the end of the chapter. He says, don't let love be a mere outward show. Recoil from what is evil and cling to what is good. Love each other devotedly and with brotherly love and set examples for each other in showing respect. Don't be lazy when hard work is needed, but serve the Lord with spiritual fervor. Rejoice in your hope, be patient in your troubles, and continue steadfastly in prayer. Share what you have with God's people and practice hospitality. It's, it's running to your guests, being in a hurry to serve one another, not sitting back and waiting to be served. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's a hard one. That's a real hard one. Be sensitive to each other's needs. Don't think yourselves better than others, but make humble people your friends. Don't be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but try to do what everyone regards as good. If possible, and to the extent that it depends on you, 
Live in peace with all people. Never seek revenge, my friends. Instead, leave that to God's anger. For the, in the Tanakh, it is written, Adonai says, Vengeance is my responsibility. I will repay. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, he will heap fiery coals of shame on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Great ending. Great ending for that he said my goodness <laughs> he didn't say that i'm saying that what a sobering chapter right what a sobering chapter it's worthy to go over this several times a year this is just another piece of the puzzle in finding out who we are in the messiah we are part of a whole and the whole is much more significant than each of its individual parts the 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 goal of the whole is much more important than our own little selves. How I feel, what I think, what goes on with me, 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 I, I, I. Okay? Unity, uh, unity in the body, getting along in the body, esteeming others as more important than ourselves in the body, loving genuinely and not hip uh, hypocritically in the body, sending examples and respecting one another in humility in the body are all virtues taught by Yeshua, our Master. He said, by this the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this you will, the world will know Okay, beloved, know this for certain, that this teaching had to pass through my, man, my, my mind and through my heart before it came out of my fingers onto an electronic piece of paper. Okay, we all have a great deal of work to do. We've all got a great deal of work to do in trying to maintain the standards that Yeshua, our Messiah, himself set for us to, to maintain as a community. It says, we have a great, wheel of, uh, great deal of work to do while it is still day. For the night is coming when no one will work. No one will work. Shaul was a great rabbi because he always encouraged us to continue on no matter how dire the circumstances seem to be. And I'll leave you with these words from Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the very first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Yeshua the Messiah. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you with all the affection of Yeshua the Messiah. So, who are we in Messiah? We are all on the same footing. And one's not above the other. Jew's not above Gentile. Gentile's not above Jew. We are all saved by the grace of God and by the mercy of God. Nothing that this person does versus that person does. Okay? And who we are in the Messiah, now that we are all under sin, now that we have all been saved by the mercies and saved by the grace of God, we are now all in the same community. Who are we in the in Messiah? We are one body. Working together to get to the same goal, not trying to tear each other apart and hurt one another. That's not our goal. In Messiah, we are working together, moving to accomplish the tikkun, the rectification the, the repair of the world, first beginning with ourselves, then our household, and then those who we are, who are in influence uh, inside of our sphere of influence. Okay?